Hello and welcome to Monobiology. Today we're going to have a little introduction to a very important scientific concept called evolution. There's a lot of ideas out there about evolution and a lot of misconceptions. Today I'm here to give you this introduction and hopefully clear up some of the misconceptions and give you a better understanding of kind of what natural selection is, because that's kind of how we get into evolution. And first of all, I'm going to introduce you to these two gentlemen. This gentleman here is named Lamarck, and this gentleman over here you're probably more familiar with. His name is Charles Darwin. Lamarck was a French naturalist who lived just, be he lived around the same time as Darwin, but a little bit before, and his idea of evolution isn't correct, of course, but it was one of the first kind of ideas that animals can change. And Darwin, of course, then came up with his theory of natural selection, so they kind of battled it a little bit, but Darwin obviously won that little battle between these two, these two naturalists. My my theory is much better than yours. We will see. We will see, Darwin. We will see what the children think about your theory. So here is just a quick overview of Lamarck's ideas. And he had an idea of something called acquired traits. What he really believed, though, was that organisms in their lifetime could develop traits that would make them more successful in their environment and that those traits could then be passed on to the next generation. Okay, so for instance, a giraffe with a short neck could in fact, given the right circumstances and, and the will to do it, grow a longer neck to reach food higher up on a tree. And that may make that particular organism, sorry, that particular giraffe, I should say, more likely to survive. Now, it's going to pass that particular characteristic onto its offspring. It kind of makes sense. It's kind of silly in another sense, too, though, to think that you can just will yourself to grow a longer neck. And it's a little... It's a little silly, at least from our perspective, you know, in, in 2014 or whenever you're listening to this. But overall, the concept that organisms could change, he was one of the first people to kind of, to kind of express that. Now, obviously, it wasn't the right theory because organisms can't change characteristics in their lifetime and then pass that on not in the way that he was suggesting anyway, right? Giraffes can't just arbitrarily grow longer necks to reach those higher branches to get those nice tender leaves. It doesn't work that way. Sorry, monsieur. Now, Darwin came up with a theory of natural selection. And interestingly, the theory isn't obviously exactly like Lamarck's, but there are some similarities. Obviously, there's a lot of differences, too. So what we have in this, in this slide here, this is Darwin as an older man, and this is Darwin as a younger man. I don't know why. I just thought I'd show you. He definitely looks more, he looks more sophisticated here. I don't know why. Is it because of the beard? Maybe the... I don't know. He's bald in both pictures. But I don't know. He just looks more sophisticated there. Anyway... Let's talk a little bit about how Darwin came up with this theory of natural selection. And also, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the actual theory. So we'll talk about how he came up with it, then we'll talk about the actual theory. Now, before we move on to the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the historical things that were going on. Now, all of, all of these events took place in, in the 1800s in terms of Darwin uh, that we're going to talk about just now. And it's interesting because during that time frame and, and actually leading up in the in the 16 and 1700s, there was a lot of changes going on in science. 
a lot of changes. For instance, it was just before Darwin came around in the 16 and 1700s, before Darwin started doing his research, that scientists started to question how old the Earth was. Now, I know that seems somewhat unrelated, but in the historical context of things, especially uh, in, in Christian in Christian kind of perspectives and in Christian countries, like uh, like most of the countries in Europe would have been at the time, you had the overwhelming belief by the majority of people that the Bible was 100% accurate and that the earth was created in and it was about a couple thousand years ago that the earth was created. And all of the animals came because God made those animals just then. And they were made exactly the way he wanted them to be made. And that was that, including humans. And that's how, they were, that's how, that's how it was done. And we didn't question that. But in the 1600s and 1700s, people started to question how old the earth was. Now that, may, again, may seem a little insignificant. But once you start to question how old the earth is, a couple thousand years old versus billions of years old, then it opens the door for questions about animals and whether or not animals have always been the same. The term here is immutable. Immutable means things don't change over the course of time. But of course, we know that that's not true. The earth has changed, and it has also been shown that organisms, animals, all kinds of different things have changed over the course of time. And that is what opened the door, and that's what got Darwin, that's the environment Darwin grew up in, where people were starting to question this stuff. Pretty cool time to live in, probably, because up until then, it was kind of like, you know, the sheep kind of following people around and not really questioning anything. People started to question things, and that was good for, good for a lot of things, good for science. So where did he get his ideas from, and how did he come up with some of these things? Well, he started he started off, actually, he was a naturalist, and he was assigned to a ship. The ship happened to be called the HMS, His Majesty's Ship at the time, Beagle. You know, HMCS stands for Her Majesty's Canadian Ship. Maybe you didn't know that. Anyway, all of our Navy ships are HMCS something or other. Uh, this is HMS, His Majesty's Ship, the Beagle. Don't know why it was called a Beagle, so... We'll have to maybe look that up some other time. Anyway, he was the naturalist, one of the scientists that was that was assigned to this ship. And this was the this was the voyage that they took. They started off obviously in the UK, and they came down here along South Africa, went down under South Africa, and came back up here to the Galapagos Islands. And interestingly, they stopped in the Galapagos Islands and. They weren't the first people to ever go to the Galapagos Islands, but Darwin was one of the first people to ever kind of make note of some of the things that were happening in the Galapagos Islands. And there is a picture of the Galapagos Islands. I'm just going to shrink that down. Okay. Okay, so the Galapagos Islands. And now why is that important? Well, the Galapagos Islands had all kinds of organisms that were somewhat unique compared to their counterparts on the continent of South, South America. For instance, there were iguanas. What? Iguanas? What? What are they, like dragons? No, of course... Darwin had seen many iguanas. He'd seen many different types of lizards and all of all shapes and sizes. But the thing that he noticed about these iguanas was that they could dive under the water. And that's, in fact, where they got their food. So most lizards don't go in the water. They don't go under the water if they do go in the water. So this was something that was unique to these organisms. Get these guys shrunk down. He also noticed another creature, and realistically, this creature is, uh, it's my favorite one, just because of the name. It's called a blue-footed booby, blue-footed booby. Anyway, you can see it has blue feet. Why it's called a booby, I don't know. There's lots of birds named boobies. Probably some, like, six-year-old kids naming them. I don't know. Anyway, 
he saw those guys, and most importantly, he saw what are known as Darwin's finches. Okay, now, what, why these are important, there's a series of islands, the Galapagos Islands, it's not the Galapagos Islands, it's the Galapagos Islands, and on each island, he noticed that there were different types of finches, and those finches were better adapted or suited to their individual types of food they would get on the islands that they lived on. He started to think, though, are these all different, completely different types of finches, or is it possible that they all came from the same finch that has then spread across the island and then adapted to its environment? Okay, so there we have the finches. Okay, and then the voyage continued. Go around the world here. And we go to Australia. Now, you guys know that there's all kinds of weird and wacky things in Australia, right? Australia is one of the only places on planet Earth, in fact, I think it's the only place other than uh, New Zealand and Tasmania, where you will find a group of mammals called marsupials, like kangaroos and koalas and wallabies. And uh, all kinds of other interesting creatures lived on Australia that didn't exist anywhere else on the planet. And so that made him start to start to question as well. Where did these animals come from? How, how are they related to any of the other animals? They're certainly not talked about in the Bible. But he started to question a lot of these things. Where did these animals come from? When he got back from his voyage on the HMS Beagle, he jotted some things down. This is one of the first drawings he drew of how he thought organisms might change over time and how they might have a common ancestor. And this is a copy of the front page of his book on the origin of species, and in which he outlines his theory of natural selection. And his theory of natural selection can be summarized in two observations and two inferences. The first observation Darwin made was that members of a population vary in their inherited traits. The second observation that he made was that all species produce more offspring than their environment can support, and many of these offspring fail to survive and reproduce. Lots of babies, not so many things surviving. Then he made two inferences. The first inference is that individuals who inherit whose inherited traits give them a higher chance of survival and reproduction in a given environment tend to leave more offspring than other individuals. Better traits, higher chances of survival and reproduction. Inference number two, the unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce will lead to the accumulation of favorable traits in the population over time. Good traits equal survival, bad traits suited for the environment, of course, lead to death. That's how natural selection works in a nutshell. Bring your questions to class. Make sure you copy down the observations and the inferences.